cool. I think that you know, if you think, if, if only if only the people who, who felt like they needed some kind of credit, you know, something, uh, some external acknowledgement, if those were the only people that supported public radio, it, it wouldn't have survived the decades it has. Then PR wouldn't have, have grown and become this really a, a powerful institution where all of the affiliate stations are, are just as important as the network itself. And we're asking you to keep that strong. one 345 9499 And you know where you could meet a lot of those people? Where's that? At the Wait, Wait, Don't oh, Tell Me live show point. coming to town Thursday, right. June 27th at the Mann Center for the Performing Arts. For a $250 pledge, you'll get a pair of tickets. We're the only ones that have these tickets at the moment. And first come, first serve for the best seats. We've already had a ton of people calling in. So you want to call now, 888-345-9499. Use your credit card, Visa, Master card, American Express Discover card, pledge $250, get all the other perks of membership, and at the same time, get something that would be a great gift or for you. WHYY monitors traffic and transit for major delays. Supported by University of Delaware MBA. Supporting WHYY, the University of Delaware's Learner MBA. Investing in every student. You can learn more at their MBA walk-in Wednesday, April 17th from 4 to 7. Details at learner.udel.edu slash MBA. Support for NPR comes from this station. And from FX, presenting the original series Fossey Burden. The story of the romantic and creative partnership between Bob Fossey and Gwen Burden. Starring Sam Rockwell and Michelle Williams. Verdon premieres April 9th at 10 on FX. From the Alliance for Lifetime Income, a nonprofit comprised of financial services organizations working to educate Americans about options for securing protected lifetime income in retirement. More at allianceforlifetimeincome.org. And from Right at Home, providing in home senior care with caregivers trained to meet the needs of seniors with dementia, Parkinson's, and other cognitive and physical conditions. Learn more at writeathome.net slash NPR. And good afternoon. It's 4.57 in the afternoon. I'm on the two with me, Patrick Stoner. We are working on a hourly goal that's coming up to an end here. We are shooting for 100 pledges of support to WHYY. We can make this. You know, we were talking earlier about that 14-year-old son of Rose. Yes. And uh, we now have something at the other end of the spectrum, much nearer state of somebody like me. Uh, like, okay. Listen, this is from uh, Gail from Columbus. I've been listening to NPR and WHYY almost since the beginning. This romance began in Beach Haven and the last five years in Columbus, New Jersey. You can tell I am an older senior citizen. I couldn't tell. Well, okay, but you are. I'm fine. And although I still serve on a couple of boards and I have five children and eight grandchildren, wow, life would be boring and lonely without NPR. My children and grandchildren are very busy. Alexa can always connect me with NPR and... NPR is never too busy to educate, entertain, and stimulate me. Thank you. And I really, it, I'm really upset about some of the conversations that are going around in the nation where they're talking about whether people are too old to serve an office or what. Right. Have you. I know what you're saying. Ageism is the last acceptable bigotry in America. Judging people because they're part of a group and not because of their individual qualities. It is not right. And there's a perfect example right there of somebody who is very much with it and deserves to be respected. HYY, and you're the one that makes that possible by calling 888-345-9499 or going to WHYY.org. Okay, All right, where are we at? 80 pledges mm -hmm. on our way to 100, and we have what? About a minute, a minute and 10 seconds in okay. order to do that, you can make this possible. Get the All Things Considered Black Mug. It's only $5 a month as a sustaining member. You get all the other perks and membership as well as you don't even have to ask about. You're just going to get them. And yet $5 on your Visa, MasterCard, American Express, or Discover card. You're not going to care about that at the end of the month. And every time you take a sip from that mug, you're the sponsor of All Things Considered. You're also behind all of the other good reasons to support public broadcasting, the most trusted entity in America for the last 16 years in a row. Asking you to do that, you can help us put us over the top. We will meet this hourly goal of 100. We are so close, and with your support, we can definitely make this. Here's that number. It is 1-888-345-9499. That's 1-888-345. 345 you can spell it out that's w-h-y-y 
or you can make a pledge online at whyy.org. And don't forget that when you make that pledge, you're part of a very special group of people, and we welcome you on board. Thank you. Supporting WHYY, Friends Central School. Since 1845, Friends Central has balanced a challenging and innovative college preparatory curriculum with a commitment to Quaker values. The program is designed to help teach compassion, instill a sense of civic responsibility, and encourage academic excellence. Located on 41 acres across two campuses in Wynwood, Friends Central offers an all-school spring open house on Tuesday, April 23rd at 9 a.m. Registration details available at friendscentral.org. This is WHYY FM Philadelphia, WMJN FM 89.7 Atlantic City, WMJZ 90.3 Cape May Courthouse, WMJD FM 89.3 Bridgeton, WMJM 89.9 Manhattan, and WMJS FM 88.1 Berlin. Live from NPR News in Washington, I'm Janine Herbst. President Trump is replacing the current head of the Secret Service. And here's Windsor Johnston reports Randolph Tex Alice is expected to leave the administration shortly. In a statement, the White House praised Tex Alice for doing a great job at the agency over the past two years and thanked him for his 40-plus years of service. Trump has selected longtime Secret Service agent James Murray to replace Alice in May. The administration has not cited a specific reason for Alice's departure. The Secret Service falls under the Department of Homeland Security, whose chief, Kirsten Nielsen, abruptly resigned after meeting with President Trump on Sunday. And here's Windsor Johnston reporting. Meanwhile, in her first public statement since announcing her resignation, Nielsen thanked the president today for the opportunity to serve the country. And here's Aisha Roscoe reports she's staying on through Wednesday to assist in the transition. Homeland Security Secretary Kirsten Nielsen says she shares President Trump's goal of securing the southern border. I will continue to support all efforts to address the humanitarian and security crisis on the border. Uh, and other than that, I'm on my way to keep doing what I can uh, for the next few days. Nielsen spoke to reporters outside her home in Alexandria, Virginia, a day after Trump announced on Twitter that she would be leaving her post. Water crossings hit a 10-year high in recent weeks as Central American families travel to the U.S. to seek asylum. Trump has said the country can no longer handle the flow of migrants. Aisha Roscoe, NPR News, Washington. More parents charged in the elaborate college admissions cheating scam have agreed to plead guilty. And as Kirk Carapeza from member station WGBH in Boston reports, actress Felicity Huffman is among them. Federal prosecutors say the former star of the TV series Desperate Housewives paid at least $15,000 to game the system and hire a ringer to correct her daughter's ACT scores. In a statement, Huffman apologized to, quote, students who work hard every day to get into college and to their parents who make tremendous sacrifices to support their children and do so honestly. Twelve other parents also agreed to plead guilty to multiple charges of fraud. So did Michael Center, the former head coach of men's tennis at the University of Texas at Austin. The U.S. Attorney's Office says all of the defendants who took tax deductions for donations that were in fact bribes have agreed to cooperate with the IRS and to pay back taxes. For NPR News, I'm Kurt Carapeza in Boston. Later tonight, Texas Tech and Virginia play for the NCAA Men's Basketball Championship that takes place in Minneapolis. Both teams are vying for their first championship win, backed by hard-nosed defenses that are among the best in the country. Wall Street ending the day in mixed territory. You're listening to NPR News. Support for NPR comes from NPR stations. Other contributors include Tire Rack, family-owned and operated for 40 years. Since 1979, Tire Rack has been committed to helping people find the right tires, wheels, and other performance parts. More at TireRack.com. Good afternoon. I'm Dave Heller, WHYY News. It's 504. U.S. Senators Tom Carper and Bob Casey have a new strategy to secure funding for local communities whose water has been contaminated by unregulated toxic chemicals known as PFOGs. WHYY's Dana Bate reports the plan came out of a meeting with local politicians and community leaders. <coughs> the senators described the meeting with local groups as sobering and heartrending. Local leaders used the meeting to vent their frustration at the federal government's inaction to regulate PFAS. The EPA
EPA announced a PFAS action plan in February, but didn't give a timeline for when drinking or groundwater standards would be passed. So last month, Delaware Senator Tom Carper introduced the PFAS Action Act, which would force the EPA to classify PFAS as hazardous chemicals. That would open up Superfund dollars to contaminated sites for cleanup and force polluters to pick up the tab. Pennsylvania Senator Bob Casey signed onto that bill, which already has the support of 30 senators on both sides of the aisle. Now, Senator Carper plans to attach it to the Defense Authorization Bill, a must-pass piece of legislation that would increase the likelihood that the act would become law. EPA should move faster, and one of the ways to compel them to move faster is for them to see whether they act or not. This is going to be in the defense bill. A defense authorization bill is passed every two years, so the soonest it would pass is 2020. But that's sooner than 2023, which many say is the earliest an EPA rule would become law. Dana Bate, WHYY News. Sports, the Phillies home tonight hosting the Washington Nationals. The 76ers take on the heat in Miami tomorrow. The evening forecast, cloudy, a chance of showers overnight, low 59 degrees. Tomorrow, a mix of sun and clouds, a chance of a stray shower, Tuesday hot, Tuesday's high 74 degrees. Sunshine for Wednesday, a little cooler, high 59. This is WHYY at 506. This is All Things Considered. From NPR News, I'm Ari Shapiro. And I'm Elsa Chang. A number of top officials at the Department of Homeland Security are on their way out. That includes the top official, Secretary Kirsten Nielsen. Today, outside her home in Virginia, she said she was working to ensure a smooth transition. I share the president's goal of securing the border. I will continue to support all efforts to address the humanitarian and security crisis on the border. DHS has been unable to stop a surge of migrant families from crossing the southern border, and that has clearly frustrated President Trump. And he signaled he now wants to take an even tougher approach. NPR's John Burnett is on the line with us from Austin to talk about what that tougher approach might even look like. Hey, John. Hey, Elsa. So do we know, first of all, why Secretary Kirsten Nielsen left? I mean, how much of a surprise was her departure? It was really abrupt. Um, she hasn't said exactly what her reasons were. She released a resignation letter that clearly contained some of her frustrations. Mm -hmm. She said, I hope the secretary will have the support, the new secretary will have the support of Congress and the courts in fixing the laws which have impeded our ability to fully secure America's borders. Um, Nielsen's defenders say she was in an impossible situation. There's only so much federal agents can do to prevent people from crossing the border, to ask for asylum unless Congress changes some laws. And the president has been growing more and more impatient with her over the last few months. How would you characterize what Nielsen has done about the situation on the border? Well, um, in the last few weeks, I've been hearing from immigration officials talking really doom and gloom about how the immigration system is overwhelmed and they've reached the breaking point. And, you know, DHS told us how it's pulling agents from all over the system to pitch in at the border to process immigrant families. And the numbers really are historic, Elsa. I mean, uh, when the figures are released this week, the Border Patrol expects more than 100,000 apprehensions in March alone, most of them families and unaccompanied kids. And immigration hardliners think DHS has been waving a white flag. Um, they want the, the new head of the department to take a more dramatic action and do something bold to keep asylum seekers at the border and don't let them into the interior. But what would that look like? What kind of bolder actions do they want to see taken? So, DHS is in sort of a bunker mode, and they're not talking, but Trump clearly wants a bold new team. Um, immigration conservatives who are influential with his administration that I talked to today said they see three policy options on the table. First, they want to change the rules so they can detain families together indefinitely until their asylum cases are adjudicated and they can be deported. They want to build tent camps hold, uh, to hold them on the border because there's not nearly enough room uh, currently in ICE detention centers and obviously that's going to be controversial and will lead to um, even more big battles in federal court. Second, flood the zone with asylum officers, with immigration judges, with ICE attorneys, put migrants on the rocket docket, turn them around and send them home. Again, immigration lawyers are extremely leery of this, saying it will violate an asylum seeker's due process. And third, some hardliners say that a version of family separation um, is still under consideration in the White House. Obviously, the end game for all of this is deterrence, to convince Central Americans it's just no longer a good idea to cross the border. I mean, they already tried.
tried family separation and they gave up on that. So how would anything be different this time if they were to try it again? Right. Well, back in uh, October, DHS first floated this idea, and they tried to rebrand it. They said that a family that crosses the border unlawfully would be given a binary choice. They could decide um, to give up their child, let the government put them in a youth shelter, or they could agree to be detained indefinitely together, possibly in a tent city. But <coughs> this is sort of a nuclear option. It's super controversial, even among Trump supporters. And there's still fallout from the first family separation policy that happened last spring, um, just this past weekend government told a federal judge in San Diego it would take them two years to track down the thousands of children who were reportedly separated from their families before zero tolerance went into effect. That's NPR's John Burnett in Austin. Thanks, John. Okay. Thank you, Elsa. Now we're going to dig into the history of a phrase that President Trump has been using a lot lately. During a visit to a U.S. Border Patrol station in California on Friday, he said this. Can't take you anymore. We can't take you. Our country is full. Our area is full. The sector is full. Can't take you anymore, sorry. He doubled down on those remarks Saturday before the Republican Jewish Coalition in Las Vegas. Can't come in. Our country is full. What can we do? We can't handle anymore. Our country is full. Can't come in. I'm sorry. It's very simple. And then yesterday he tweeted, Our country is, all caps, full. Trump's comments were directed at Central American migrants. In other countries, far-right leaders are using the same phrase to reject people from Syria, North Africa, and other parts of the world. Mark Hetfield is president and CEO of HIAS, the Jewish nonprofit organization that helps resettle refugees here in the U.S. Welcome to All Things Considered. Thank you, Ari. That line, Our Country is Full, has a particular resonance for Jews. What echoes do you hear in that phrase? Well, we hear echoes dating back to 1921, when the door was slammed shut on people who were fleeing persecution. And we hear echoes from the St. Voyage of the St. Louis, which uh, coincidentally uh, occurred 80 years ago next month. When For people who aren't familiar away. with the St. Louis, we're talking about 1939. This was a ship carrying Jewish refugees that was turned back from the United States. Yeah, absolutely. Um, to Germany originally, and we ended up distributing many of them in other of the uh, 937 passengers who were sent back to other European countries, and over 250 of those perished. We heard uh, participants in the Re Republican Jewish Coalition cheering President Trump's remarks over the weekend, and President Trump has stressed his support for Israel. It doesn't seem that he was trying to echo rhetoric of the Holocaust, does it? Well. I don't want to make comparisons with uh, the rhetoric of the Holocaust, but what I will say is that the entire system of asylum protection and refugee protection in this country and in the world was built on the ashes of the Holocaust to make sure that never again trapped inside of a country where they are facing persecution. And <laughs> so to hear him make those comments on Shabbat to the Republican Jewish coalition that asylum is a scam and that our country is being invaded, the same word that the murderer used who went into the Tree of Life synagogue in Pittsburgh about people who were coming to this country. I mean, that was deeply offensive to us at highest. When you look at the present day across the political and geographic landscape, where do you see this remark of country is full coming up today? Well, we see that remark being repeated all over the country, and there's there's simply no basis in in truth to it. Um, you know, on the, oh, I was I was end. thinking of far right parties in in Germany, oh. in Sweden, in in the UK, where we've oh. heard people say similar things. Yeah, absolutely. This is this is a global epidemic, and once again, um, as has happened at, at a few times in our past, the United States is leading the race to the bottom instead of the race toward protecting refugees. Um, yeah. As no, no, your organization's mission is resettling refugees in the United States, so you're not a disinterested observer. Uh, border crossings have nearly doubled over a year ago. Border Patrol caught almost 100,000 people entering the U.S. from Mexico last month, the highest number in more than a decade. So setting aside the echoes of the phrase, our country is full, do you think there is any point where the number of people trying to come into the U.S. just becomes too great? 